today we follow up with regional art with a far older history and the intricacies and symbolism of Coast Salish weaving. And our guest is Dr. Susan Pavel. And uh, we met Dr. Pavel over a year ago when she attended one of our Schmidt House events. In fact, it was our art show for the uh, advertising art show that we had here. And we were immediately intrigued with her knowledge and over 20 years of experience studying the heritage of this amazing art form of the Coast Salish people. Uh, she learned much from tribal elders about this generational style of weaving and has it in her heart to share and teach her skills and heritage to others, and that includes us today. I should mention, too, she's a currently a member of the Artist Gallery in Olympia, right at the, well, just outside the Capitol Auto Mall, and some of those complexes, well, she'll explain where it is, but it's right, right close to the mall there. And uh, she uh, has items for sale there related to the Coast Salish weaving and other woven items. And you might want to wish to visit there and see what's available when she's working there. She'll be demonstrating <coughs> weaving as well. And, uh, just a fun opportunity for you, so don't forget that. But uh, I knew with the uh, interest in local history and tribal history here in our area, uh, we would have a good turnout, and certainly we have it. Uh, let's take, get have a warm Schmidt House welcome to Dr. Susan Pavel. <laughs> Are we switching seats, or do you go back? I'll stand up. Oh, that's right. I forgot. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Haichka Siem. I am greeting you with a traditional greeting and traditional words of the people of this area. We are traditionally a pond Squaxin Island people land right now, and I just want to acknowledge that for the moment and say thank you and give blessings and grace to the people who are originally here and now we are here to share in the wealth and the abundance of all of our people. My name is Dr. Susan Pavel. My Indian name is Sahlamitsa. I'm going to move around a bit because I do like to look at everybody. So I see that I can't quite see everybody when I'm standing in one place. So hopefully as I move, I won't be moving too much. And if I'm moving too much, somebody will say, stop moving so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, my Indian name is Sahlamitsa. And my husband is Donald Michael Pavel. And he is from Skokomish, which is the neighboring tribe here uh, in Shelton, next to Squaxin. But where we are is traditionally Squaxin territory. And the weave style that you see here behind me is indigenous and indicative of this region. And when I say this region, I mean all the way Vancouver Island, south into western Washington, east, no, west of the Cascades towards the water, all the way down to the Columbia River. So that whole territory bound by water, bound by mountains, Bound and, and all water, it's really water boundaries and, and the mountains that make up the Salish territory. And there's also, so that's Coast Salish, but there's also Interior Salish. And when you go across the mountains, it's different. The clothing is different, the living is different, and it's based upon what's in your area, right? It's based on the animals you can find, the clothing, the the plants that you can make your clothing from. But I'm here to talk about Coast Salish weaving. And that's very distinct from what's farther north beyond the Coast Salish territory, which is more uh, Raven's Tail and Chilkat weaving as you head farther north. And then as you head south, it becomes different as well. I think when I speak of fiber weaving, what comes to people's mind and the imagery that usually comes up is Navajo weaving, yes? Yeah, and so that's, that's a very dominant view in our minds, and it's beautiful work. And I want you to know that we have our own beautiful work here. And we just don't get to see it much, or it's, it's not as prevalent for many reasons. But today I have some lovely examples to show you and, and we can talk about. And, and afterwards, you're very, very, it's a packed house. I didn't realize it would be quite so packed. Um, but I usually like to pass things around, and I might be able to pass a few things around for you, but if you are at all tactile, and that is really why I brought things to touch, and, because weaving is a tactile experience. Yes, it beckons to you to, I mean, the moment you stand in front of something, your hand, without thinking, with no thought, your hand reaches out, and then you think, oh, should I touch that or not touch that? 
So you're welcome to touch anything up here. And I invite you to actually come do that. Um, I learned from my master teacher. I'm going to take a drink of water, because in what, two minutes, I'm already parched. My master teacher was Bruce Miller Sobie, or Subi, and he came from the Shelton area, which was the Skokomish Reservation. He has passed away now. Um, sometimes I can find people who still had met him or know of him. Anybody in the room who might have met him or knew of him? Yeah, Bruce Miller from Skokomish, yeah. Uh, he was, in my summation, a renaissance man. He knew a lot about a lot, and he renewed and revived many things in his lifetime. And I was his fiber apprentice. He had a basket apprentice. He had a medicinal plant apprentice. He had a language apprentice. He had a Sioan or our religious ways of the smokehouse apprentice. A few there, really. And so he had many people kind of under his wing, and he would disseminate his knowledge and his wealth amongst all of us. And, and while he tried to teach me basketry, I couldn't really do it. I have just a very small um, <laughs> bottom of a basket that's <laughs> over 20 years old that I just never got past. I'm going to pause for a moment. Are we good? Yeah? OK, good. Because um, I can hear that a little bit. If, I know, yeah, right? yeah. So do you want me to stay over here a little more? OK. <laughs> um, we're trying to avoid the feedback. Because I really wanted to be able to talk amongst you and not have the podium between us. So Thank you. you're welcome. Um, so I learned from Bruce Miller back in the summer of 1996. And um, I'm positive I didn't know what I was doing when he said, get up. <laughs> get off the couch and come help me. But you know, that's really, if you had met him, that's really kind of how it worked. He was also our medicine man. And I think those kinds of people can see in a very different way than I can see. And so I think he saw something there that he said, aha, I think I can pour my knowledge into this one, this one being me. So what I did was I apprenticed, and I apprenticed, and in some ways I feel like I was still apprenticing when he passed away. Because I don't know if you ever learn everything. Yeah? And I'm getting just about that age where I realize how much I don't know. So, um, and I'm very, very excited to share all of it with you. Um, I do, as Don had mentioned, I do have weavings for sale at the Artist Gallery. Does anyone know what the original material for the fiber weaving was? Goat. Dog. Somebody said goat and somebody said dog. I'm going to go with those two. Mountain goat wool. This one I'll pass around. Mountain goat wool and a dog that was domesticated. Okay, and I'm going to pass this around. You are welcome to open it and feel it. In fact, I encourage you to open the bag and feel the wool. I do, okay? Um, but if anybody is a fiber person in here and you open it, you're going to see that the staple or the length of the fiber is not very long. And so the dog was domesticated, which is still something I find absolutely fascinating. There's two things I find eternally fascinating after decades of weaving. And one is the dog. Because you see, the practice of husbandry wasn't happening until, uh, any, with anything. We were, we were a people here who only, we fished into the, into the waters, but we, we weren't um, migratory. We didn't move with the herds like our, our plains brothers and sisters did. We stayed in one spot. We had summer camps, but we didn't move per se. But they, so they had this dog that was domesticated that they kept separate on the islands so that that didn't interbreed and mess up the, the wool. And it wasn't a very big dog. It was about 25, 30 pounds, a little bit smaller. Um, they are extinct. However, if there's anybody who wants to partner with me to revive this dog, I would absolutely, <laughs> because you can, right? There's a lots of DNA, they have a pelt at the Smithsonian of the dog. I see the guy is coming. <laughs> Can you all hear me in the back? Okay, good. 
Is it that I'm talking too loud? Is that where we're getting feedback? No. No. Just up a little loud. I turned it down a little bit. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, the dog. And so the dog was a mix between a Pomeranian and a Samoid. And so it had that long enough, about a three inch staple, so long enough fur that you could cart it or comb it with the mountain goat wool that's coming along. So those were the two main animal fibers. And then there was other kinds of fibers that were added in that um, would help with the loft or the, the lift of it all. And I've brought samples of both. I don't recommend that you open either one of these. Um, one is fireweed fluff, which is a lot whiter, looks silky like, fireweed fluff. And the second is cattail fluff. When you open it, it'll go psh. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, if you're just dying to feel it, go ahead. But I mean, you, I think you get a sense of it, yeah. Um, and I'll pass those along as well. So those are uh, two, there's other, uh, we did use bark, so someone had mentioned bark, but bark was really only used in the warp, which would be all of the yarns that go straight up and down, and that was to strengthen the warp and to repel mis uh, moths a bit, um, but, but not all the time, you wouldn't find it there all the time. Um, and what I have uh, brought for absolutely your enjoyment, um, and I, this is the first time I've brought it out, so um, I do recommend you come up and touch it, uh, is this old weaving wrapped around this blue tablecloth thing. I, and I don't think you can see it back there, but it's the weaving on the far right-hand side. And you, you're going to tell. When you walk up here, you can see it's an old weaving. And it is dated for uh, early 1900s. Um, and so it's a museum type, I mean, you would see that in a museum where you couldn't get behind the glass, but I say come touch it anyway, because it's a tactile experience. It absolutely, you want to feel it. So this one is mountain goat wool. Um, I'm not so sure that there's dog wool mixed in here. Um, I, do, I don't think so. If there is, it's very little in there. So they were able to spin it somewhat. I, and there's some other, a few other fibers in that one. But Come see it. That's the wool. There are fabric strips in there, and you'll see that, and they'll be very obvious to you. The fabric strips were a trade item. And as you may or may not be familiar with, trade items were always about wealth, showing wealth. And so if you, if you had something worthy, I have something that you want, and I, you have something I want, then we trade for that, and it shows that, aha, I have something that somebody covets or wants uh, that raises the value of something. So that's hence the trade item inside of that particular blanket. Um, but before I even go into that, I, I want to I put a pause on all of the materials for a moment and, and maybe illuminate a little bit more about the weaving itself. As I talk about trade items, I want you to know that woven items were, yes, blankets. And you may have seen pictures of this or not. I'm not sure. Um, but woven blankets out of mountain goat wool and dog's wool were, uh, I should just, I hope, I don't think you're going to be able to see this, but if you can, that's great. Mm -hmm. There's a picture at the very bottom. Mm -hmm. It's three men in three white robes in this black and white photo. And it's very similar to the woven item up here that you're going to see. Okay, very, very similar. It was definitely for high class people. Mountain goat wool is hard to get. <laughs> They're not low-lying goats where you could just go out your door and get them, right? They're, and it's, if you've at all done any hiking in, our, in, in the Olympics or the Cascades, it's quite a ways up there. And so, as, as you can surmise, anything that's hard to get drives the value up, right? Just like diamonds, or they say, they're, I think they're hoarding the diamonds, but right? Hard to get, and so you, it's hard, drives the value up. So mountain goat wool products, weavings, headbands. This is a um, contemporary headband of sheep's wool. Headbands, I'll pass this one around. Uh, dresses, skirts, uh, dance aprons. All, this is sheep's wool. This is sheep's wool. <laughs> Look at this. Um, yeah, yeah, see, you just reach right out, don't you? Yeah. Um, 
Oh, and this is This what? is sheep's wool. This, oh, this is actually um, a seal. Oh. There's a trait I traded for. Do you have to kill the goat before you show no. it? No. Um, she asked if I had to kill the goat. No. Um, no, I, no. In fact, they, if you at all do any hiking, uh, you'll, um, you'll see it on the bushes. But ask me about that in just a moment, because I don't want to lose my train of thought about the clothing. And, and that the chiefs of the tribes and the high class wore the items. So that's, it's, and so that would be what high class status people wore. And then your everyday wear would be cedar bark clothing. Mm -hmm. Cedar bark is very abundant. You can get cedar bark very easily. And so um, it's actually, if you pound it, they made baby diapers out of it. So it would get very soft. What? Yeah, so there's, there's lots of background on all that too. So anyway, that's what I wanted to share with you about the clothing and some of the other things, and I'll, I'll talk about those here in a bit. Um, but back to the materials that are coming around. This one I probably won't pass around. But this is just, if you get a chance, you can come up and see these things. Um, but this begins to point out some of the different kinds of plant materials to dye the yarn with. Okay, and so um, there's an example of wolf moss, which is on the east side of the mountains. There's some lungwort lichen. There's madrona bark in here and red cedar bark, all of which you use to dye, to dye the wool with and in, in different ways, and that's a whole other topic. But you're welcome to come and check this one out too. Um, also, with the plant material, with the, with the, raw materials you need to get it from raw material form <laughs> and you need to spin it right into yarn right, you need to spin spin that into yarn so what i'm holding here is a traditional spindle whirl that i spin on it's still usable and what you might have seen in um in a contemporary version usually any native art that you see that's in the round like my necklace or um Let's see if I can think of an example out there. Oh, Squawks, I'm sure Squawks and Island Museum has some lovely examples there. But um, usually they're a spindle whirl. And what they're depicting is there's, none, there's no design on this one, though I probably should have one, um, would be carved elements on this side. And so this is done sitting down, and I'm spinning it off of my leg. So the thing is spinning, 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 and I'm holding the yarn up here, and as this spins, it turns my yarn, oh. is how this is done. Yeah. And so the images that would be carved into here would usually be, be transformative images, because what the spindle world does is it transforms something that was like this into something like this. So then you would take that and you would ply it, and then you would weave it. And this, this loom is an example, uh, a smaller example, because I have seen looms. <laughs> there was one, uh, the University of British Columbia in their Museum of Anthropology last year. Did, did anybody get to see that exhibit? No, you heard about it maybe? Um, had a loom, no kidding, that was probably from that wall. Oh, it was probably as wide as this whole room. I was, I was amazed. I'd never seen one that big. So the looms look, this is, while this is a contemporary version, it's really the same thing. It's a frame. So you have two uprights that traditionally would have been bore into the ground. So there would be a bit of a point at the end. And then you had two horizontals here. And these would be opened so that the horizontals would, would be able to come in and out like this. They wouldn't be, you know, there were no screws back then. <laughs> <laughs> so there would be a hole that would sat inside of. And the same with all four corners. And, and, you know, I mean, this is a modern version, but you get the idea. And then what's also on here, what allows this weaving to go around and around is this third bar. So you can imagine, if you had a loom as big as this room, how are you going to move all that yarn <laughs> right, to keep weaving at? And so this floating third bar is what does it. 
And that is the second thing I absolutely marvel at after decades of weaving, is this little bar right here. How in the world did they think of that? It, it's amazing because all you have to do to finish this weaving, besides finish the weaving, <laughs> is to pull the third bar out. And these two ends literally open up this way. So there's no cutting, no cutting, no waste. So if you're at all a weaver, you're like, wow, no waste on your woven item. Because there's waste in, in weaving. It's just, just it's the way it, just the way it goes. And I will be demonstrating this tomorrow from 4 to 7 at the artist gallery. Um, but anyway, so that's how that moves, around and around. And then you can also imagine, you can also imagine that if you're weaving, you, and you, you're, you're sitting, perhaps, usually, you're sitting and then you're, you're weaving back and forth, and then all of a sudden you're, you're done, you're like way up here, this would be very tiring on your shoulders, on your back. So once you move that third bar back down, then you're weaving right here again, or at your comfort level. And so, ingenious. Ingenious. The loom setup is ingenious to me. <clears throat> okay, now in Salish, this is a lovely book, by the way, if you at all, our guild has it. I, I talked with one guild member in here. Um, <laughs> the Olympia Weavers Guild has it. You can still find this book. It's out of print. But, you know, you can still find it. She's done a lovely job. It's a bit dated. Um, we know a lot more than when she did this in the probably 70s, late 70s, early 80s. Um, but it is a lovely example. Here's some color pictures on the back of some of the weaving. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so um, I'll pass the book around. And don't covet it too much because there's a ton of people to look at. Um, but what, there, what you'll find in the weave style are two distinct types of weaving. For my weavers in the room, or even for my novices, you'll get it. You'll get it. On this particular example right here, this whole white section is a, what we call a twill, which is all the warp going this way and all the weft going this way. You can see it. You can see all the warp and you can see all the weft. On this colored piece right down here, you can't see any of the warp, which is the white going straight up and down. This has all been finger twined. So each time, here's a little black piece, each time this turns once and goes around the other next warp, turns once, goes around the next warp. And you do it with your hands, you do it with your fingers. So that's what, that's what the borders of this is. That's what the border of this one is. That's what this entire one is. is complete, this is a completely <coughs> twined weaving. And I always get the question, how long did it take you? <laughs> long, 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 long time. Um, if it took me, let me get an example. Oh, here's a great example. You asked me how long it took me, yeah? OK. It's mom, not my mom, but Dawn's mom. Um, but it's a great question. How long does it take you? One thing, you, my work ethic is such that I can sit for about 15 minutes tops, <laughs> more like 10, and then I have to get up. But then I have multiple projects going on at once. So this, if I sat down continuously to do maybe this one, it would take me maybe a week, maybe. But that's still, I don't sit for eight hours and do stuff like, I just don't. Um, but uh, if I, if the, the, what I want to tell you, really, is the amount of time it takes me to finish this sash on this one, I could maybe get this much done. So it's massively labor intensive, this part, this part. And if you're at all familiar with basketry, you turn once and you go around each warp end. So it's, you're tr doing your, your fingers each time around and around. And you have to be amb ambidextrous. Each hand has to be able to, because once you write each stand here, you take your other hand and you go back the other way. Okay. So you would, in the weavings, you would find things that were fully twilled, which is this example up here, which is a, the um, traditional blanket up here. You would find things completely twined, which is this one. I'm going to pass this one around as well. Or you would find a combination of the two. Wow. 
And if you, the book, if you're at all looking at the book, you'll kind of see inside there, there's things that are twilled, twined, and then there's the combination of the two. And so that's what you would see in Salish weaving of, of sorts. So when you see somebody wrapped in a shawl, a, a, like a blanket of, of just that kind, if it took a week to do just, how long does it take to make a whole blanket? Does, it, does many people work on it at the same time, or is it a one-person task? Definitely a whole family can work okay. on it. Wow. Yeah. Um, I'll give you my own personal example. So um, before I was married, my husband was gathering mountain goat wool. And then he met me, and I think they were, my uncle Bruce Miller and my husband, Michael Pavel, I think they were in cahoots together, because I think they said, you know, we need to make a weaver. Because <laughs> we've got all this mountain goat wool, right? And so my husband had been collecting mountain goat wool before we met, and then for another probably, hmm, I don't know exactly, but I know the total amount of time, it took about 14 years for me to finish one fully twined mountain goat wool blanket. Twelve of those years was in gathering the wool. Because you can't buy it. You cannot buy mountain goat wool. You have to gather it. And as I mentioned, they're not low-lying goats. <laughs> so um, with 12 years of gathering, it took me another two years then to process all the wool, dye the wool, spin the wool, you know, spin the wool, dye the wool, warp it up, and then do all that twining back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth. Yes? Did you have to pick it all off branches, or did you ever catch a mountain goat? All off, <laughs> all off the branches. Yeah. All off the branches. And now, as I would share the story, we would have other people donating. And we would have um, other hikers hiking. And we would have other people, you know, gifting us the wool. Um, I had this, I was in the midst of doing all that, and I shared at the, um, in Tacoma at the Washington State History Museum about this. And a woman came up to me, and um, she said, and she was pretty um, taken. You know, like there was, you could tell there was something going on for her. And um, so I was patient and I listened and she said, you know, my mom and I used to hike Mount Rainier together, her and her mother. But my mother's passed away now. And we have saved all this mountain goat wool that we would collect together just because we thought it was something we should collect, though they didn't know why. <laughs> and she takes out the bag, it was a gallon bag, and she hands it to me. And she goes, I want my mother to live on. <laughs> and so I take the opportunity when I can to share that story because really that is how we live on, right? Through the gifting of something to somebody else, through the gesture and the kindness that we extend ourselves to another because that story lives in my breath and I speak it out and now it's in your memory. And you may or may not speak it, but you see it's, it's moved on. Her mother's passed. I, I'm not sure if she's, I, I assume she's still alive, but you see it's moved, it's, it's, the longevity of it vibrates. Mm -hmm. It vibrates. And a lot of Salish weaving, and, uh, and while we only have an hour, we have till one, right? Yes. So we have, oh great, oh good. Oh, we're only half an hour in. Um, <laughs> A lot of, uh, of what I am speaking to and talking about is about the how-to of the weaving, the, the technical part, the hands-on part, that sort of thing. But what I want to point to and share with you and try to illuminate in the room is the spiritual aspect of what's going on here, the context for the content of weaving. And the context is that we cleanse ourselves. We know as weavers, and anyone that makes something for another, that that thing is gonna go on to somebody else. We don't make them for ourselves. We just don't. We don't. It took me over 20 years to make something for myself, and at that it's probably gonna go. Right? So we as weavers, 
knowing that this item is meant to move on past our life, past our hands, our blessing, our goodwill, our mana, our spirit, our essence is constantly inside of these things, constantly. I mean, it, it means that hours and hours and hours of, and hours and hours and years it takes to make just one small thing, we know it lives on. And so the intention when we wrap people with a blanket or a weaving, the intention of that is manyfold. We intend to keep them safe. We intend to honor their dignity. Sometimes we wrap people in sadness and to keep them and their spirit in one place. There are many reasons that we wrap people and I just want to presence that for you so that you have the, the essence of that. It's a whole way of being. And I, I, I know not, not everybody goes there. That's okay. But I want you to know I go there. I want you to know that that is who I am when I'm sitting at that loom and when I gift these things away or when I sell these things. That is who, that's who I am. And if that's not who I am when I sit at that loom, then I get up. I get up because I don't want my energy and uh, if it's off or there's ill or I'm mad at the kids or I'm mad at the husband, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I'm going to get myself up, right? Cleanse myself off, brush myself off, go outside, be with nature, something, so that I don't weave that into the weaving because it lives past my lifetime and it's intended to wrap somebody else. So I, I'm very particular about those things. Yes? You explained um, twining is where you wrap the warp. So twill would be where you went in and out between them? Okay. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? I'm going to... Oh, yes. Do, do, do any of these pieces go into graves with people? Um, not recently. But they used to? Mm, no. Okay. They'd be burned. Interesting. Released. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the body of the person or the work? The work. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it would be dismantled and then cleaned and then uh, used for other things. There was definitely the blanket toss, mm -hmm. which you may or may not have heard, which is <laughs> during a potlatch, there would be piled, and that book shows a picture of it. <clears throat> because to, to potlatch, means a redistribution of wealth. A redistribution of wealth, the intention of that is much like your breath. If I'm going to breathe in, I have to breathe out at some point. <sighs> right? You cannot, and nor should you, bring everything to you. If you did, you at some point have to exhale. You have to release at some point. Yes? Your breath is the constant reminder to potlatch. Constant, constant, constant reminder. I didn't make the oxygen coming in. I am just the recipient of. And now I'm exhaling and giving it all back out. Okay? Right? A potlatch is much like that. So the family who is putting on the potlatch have received all these items of wealth and honor and dignity. And at some point, you've, you've acquired enough. And you need to potlatch. You need to redistribute the wealth. You need to breathe back out. You need to give things away. You need to honor your family and your community with this wealth. The more we give out, the more that comes back in. So that's the idea of that. I'm not really sure how I got off on that one. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You're very welcome. Can I ask you a question? Absolutely. What do you think 
button blankets have to do with the, you know, with the pot lights in there? So button blankets be belong to our brothers and sisters far north. Oh. Because, can I continue? There was a lady I met at Joanne's Fabrics, yeah. and she asked me if I was a weaver or a spinner. She was looking for red fabric to make a button blanket, and it was in Shelton at a great big uh, pot latch over there. And she wanted to know if that was okay to do polyester because she couldn't afford the wool. <laughs> but I just wondered, you know, if that had something to do, you know, the pot latch, you know, with the button mm. blankets. Mm -hmm. But it's not, it's Alaskan. I don't know if you heard her answer there, but her question is about the pot lat I mean the button blankets. And button blankets are not indigenous to this to Coast Salish region. <laughs> button blankets belong traditionally to our brothers and sisters far north, Alaska and farther. Um, just as totem poles. Oh my. Oh my. Belong to our brothers and sisters farther north. And um, I was just talking about this yesterday. My guess, and my, um, my educated guess, and, mm, is uh, that because totem poles and button blankets and that sort of thing are what I would call very out there, very vibrant, very obvious, very showy, I think that the non-native person saw that and assumed it belonged down here. So then when things started to get purchased or commissioned, they were looking towards our brothers and sisters farther north to make these things and then build them and then put them in downtown Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> or across the road. Yeah. The, yeah. Right? But they don't but what is a similar item to a totem pole is a welcome figure. And a welcome figure, I think Squaxin might have a welcome figure. We out at Skokomish have a new community center, and we have two welcome figures on the one side of the building. And that's a traditional, it, it's a welcoming. Uh, Evergreen, Evergreen has some welcome figures on their campus. Yeah, as you, I think the main entry, that roundabout there, there's at least one, maybe two welcome figures that stand this way, yes? Mm -hmm. and, that's, and that is to welcome people coming. It's a welcome. Their welcome figures were used for other things, but in general, that's what they were for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Not the button okay. Oh yeah, yeah. Good. Thank you. What is a button blanket? Um, it's it, it's a it's a similar a blanket, a big blanket that's worn and used it's for protection. Red. It's got to be bright red. And it's um it has colors of red and black in it. And, there's, and the buttons are used to imbricate designs and usually clan designs for that family. So you'd see an eagle on the back. A big eagle used buttons and made this big design of an eagle, of a bear, of a uh, raven, whatever your clan family was. And they had clan families up north. So where would the button, I mean, I say a button and I think of a piece of plastic that holds my shirt together. No, shells. <laughs> Shell. Shell. Shells. 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 They're all white. They're all white. <laughs> okay, so, <clears throat> but what I also want to pass around um, because you may or may not get yourself up here, uh, is this cent the center white portion of this weaving, which was woven by my master teacher, Bruce Miller, um, is mountain goat wool. This is mountain goat wool in the center. So I'm going to pass this one around, and you should touch this one. You should absolutely touch this one. Okay. So I was talking about um, the different items that were used or worn. I sent around a contemporary headband. Yeah, I think you might have gotten it back there. If you've seen pictures, uh, old pictures of baskets, and you may or may not have seen what is, this is called a tump line, and it was woven. This is a, tr this is a contemporary version. But it's very much like this, so it's wider, okay? Wider than a headband per se. But what this is, um, what this, how this is done is it's worn this way, and then there's a big basket back here. So these are lashed, these are purposely long. They're lashed onto the 
basket back here. And I think Squaxin probably, ha the Squaxin Museum and Research Center probably has an example of this, I've, I think. Um, but it's a big basket and it's a burden basket. So that what this does is it takes the basket out of your hands. Because this is tied, you get two hands, right? Tied. So that as I'm picking and gathering and doing my work, I just put it back here, wow. right? Smart, so smart, smart, smart. Right? And then your hands are free. You don't have, they don't have to be holding something with one hand like that. So I'm going to pass these around. And these two, uh, my uncle Bruce Miller wove these. Um, so they're pretty precious to me since he's passed away now. But you should absolutely check them out. I'll pass these around. And what are those called again? Tump lines. Tump. T-U-M-P line. L-I-N-E. Tump line. And, um, and you'll see there I have definitely, there's def I've done a lot of research in the collections around the world, and there's definitely baskets that still have tump lines connected. You'll see a lot of tump lines separated from the baskets in pictures or if you search museum things. Yeah. Yes? I know this is about weaving, but is there a story behind the extinction of the dog? Um, my understanding about the, ex she's asking about the extinction of the dog. Oh, she's going to take it. <laughs> The dog, as I mentioned earlier, was kept on islands or kept separate from, so they didn't interbreed and mess up the wool, right? Yeah? Um, but with non-native contact, the dogs got dispersed. And so they got bred, you know, I mean, if you're trying to save your family, and you can't necessarily keep, you may or may not be able to keep track of the dog, but upon non-native contact, the dogs got dispersed. Yes. On the dog, they, you said there was a Samoyed and Pomeranian mix? They, so this, the, she's asking about the type of dog it was. I know, but that's what you said. It was a, a Pomeranian. Yeah, I'm just trying to repeat what you're saying. The, the Samoyeds came from Siberia originally. How did they get here? So um, I don't know how the dogs got here. The answer, that's the short answer of it. When they do the DNA on the pelt that's at the Smithsonian, they see there's trait, there's relationship to the Pomeranian, the Samoyed. So they have these long, the, the fur, and so I don't know exactly how that all happened, or, or not, I don't know. Maybe they came by the settlers. Yeah. No, it was before the settlers came. Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, okay. Now these days, as I was talking about um, that weavings are so typically, this is, this is a sash. This is a pretty contemporary thing these days. A lot of folks, especially men, um, a full woven blanket is a lot to wear, especially if you have to be a speaker or something of that sort. So often what, uh, so now what we've done is we are weaving sashes. And so the sashes is an example of how it keeps the person, they still can talk and there's not this big, weaving to wear, but it's still representative, I just covered my mic, it's still representative of, of, uh, of wealth and honor and tradition. And so you may see at, at gatherings, sashes are worn. Um, I'll pass this one around too. What you may or may not be able to see is that this is a blanket pin. It is uh, wood. This one's wood. I have elk bone and deer bone pins. Um, and let's see, I typically like bone or wood pins. I have some other contemporary ones too that are blanket pins, but um, some people think it's like a hair pin or something, but that's what this is and that's what it's for, is to keep the weaving closed. Do you carve them yourself? Uh, my husband does. Thank you. This one's coming around too, okay. Um, one of the things that is my particular specialty that I like to, um, talk about and share is because I just really like to do it, is the dyeing part, or to make, to color the wool with dye. And so there are very much some traditional dyes that were used, the red cedar bark, the alder bark, um, there was a mud, a, a type of mud in the silt that produced black. Um, there's a Oregon grape, uh, the Oregon grape plant itself, the berries produce purple, but the bark and the roots produce yellow. Um, those are all very traditional colors. But I have also expanded and learned 
and other plant materials in our region. So I really try to focus on plants that are indigenous here and die with those sorts of things. Um, however, I did play with uh, indigo last year and that was kind of fun, but that's not a native plant. Um, but what this is, is it's another little weaving. Here's that third bar I was talking about. It moves the weaving around. So amazing to me, so, so amazing. But what I have on here on this side, oh, look at this, here it is, are some yarns, the sample of yarns and what they are, because I, I don't remember, especially when I stand up here. <laughs> okay, so some of these, the, the yellows and the oranges that are on here. Uh, mushroom, a type of honey mushroom. It's honey mushroom, king bolete mushroom. By the way, the new mushrooms can produce so much colors. Dyer's polypore and madrona bark. And that's these, this assortment of yellows and oranges on the front. On the back, uh, Oregon grape, the berries. And actually, if you can see this one, these are two different shades of Oregon grape. Oh, and even a third one. Those are all Oregon grape. And it was at different times or different dye baths that I used, meaning the first dye bath will produce one color. To, it pulls out a lot of the color. The second dye bath gets a little more diluted. If you leave it for a decade and you forget about it in your garage, <laughs> it'll probably produce that color. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, choke cherry. This is choke cherry. Is that the black one? Uh, they're both choke cherry. Wow. One's with iron and one's with alum. Mm -hmm. And that's a mordant. And the quality of the wool you're dyeing changes the color. Yes, of course. Yes, yes, yes. <clears throat> yes. Okay, and I think I'll just leave this one up here and you're welcome to come up and check it out uh, when you, uh, if you'd like to. Okay, how are we doing for time? Do we, do we, do I stop talking now and do questions or? Yeah, yeah, do that. Do, do I do that? Okay. <laughs> okay, wait, wait, no, I'm gonna say some more. Um, this one. Here's another little example of uh, plant materials and what they were uh, dyed with, the plants that they were dyed with. Um, and you're welcome to come look at this one as well. Um, I think I wanna point out only one little thing and that is, uh, <laughs> because it was such a fun experiment. Um, any, any dyers in the room? Anybody who does any natural dyeing or even chemical? Okay. So to dye, you, the, the yarn has to open somehow for the color to take. And so it's usually a two-step process. We mordant the wool and then we dye the wool. So the mordanting process is a chemical process. And today we use alum. It's a very friendly uh, chemical. But there is a traditional item used, right? Because you didn't just go to Safeway and buy the alum. <laughs> These days you can, but you couldn't do it back then. Um, anybody might have an idea of what would be used if alum, ammonia, um, those sorts of things are used as a urine. 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 <laughs> yes, yes. Ash. yes. Yeah, what? ash. Yeah. Fermented urine, particularly. Oh. And um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 maybe we should try it. Yeah. Um, uh, but fermented urine. And so uh, when I understood this and learned it and my boys were little, <laughs> <laughs> they had a great time that whole summer. Mom wanted wow. pee in the bucket on the porch. <laughs> All summer. And um, just so you know, it actually doesn't smell after, I mean, you do the whole process and it's fine and, and it works, it does work. I'll let you know it does work. And it was a great experiment for those kids when they were little, so. Okay, um, I'll wrap it up there. And do you have any questions? Yeah, questions? Yes. Where do you get the deep red? Okay, so this one right here is all commercial dyes. This is all commercial dyes, yeah. So if you, from your, where you're sitting, you may not be able to tell what a commercial dye is, but as you get closer, I think you'll be able to tell what it, it it's just more vibrant. And the, the natural colors are more muted, a little more muted. This is just a little bag I was gonna leave up here. Okay, uh, yes. So when you pull the third bar out, do you have a tube? 
So she's asking, what, when I pull the third bar, what happens? And so yes, there essentially is a tube or a loop because it's one yarn that's continuously wrapping, like a figure eight. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Yes. Yes, sir. What, uh, how did they, I understand how you get the reds and blues and stuff, but how did they get the black? What did they use for black? There was a mud, there is a mud in the silty parts of the estuaries. It's a black mud. It's pretty dense. Yeah. Did you have to boil it down or something? No, you, there's a process. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Can you speak a little bit to shapes that are being used in oh. weaving? Are there traditional shapes sure. and yeah, motifs? Yeah, yeah great. Um, she's asking about traditional shapes or motifs. What you're going to see in that book, but I can show you examples here. There is a finite number of shapes or motifs or design elements in the weavings. It's not like basketry. Basketry, there are hundreds of different kinds of depictions that you can put into a basket. With Salish weaving, it's about five or six, and that's it. We just combine them differently, we, cha we open it up more, we change the colors, that sort of thing. So right here on the edge, this is a zigzag. <laughs> Something about that zigzag. <laughs> this is a zigzag. This portion is a zigzag. They all look a little bit different because of the coloring, because of the size of the zigzag. And, de and you may have a follow-up question, so I'll just answer it. What does the zigzag mean? Yes? Well, it depends on the weaver. So sometimes when he or she is weaving it, she will have something else, some other context going on for her or him that will have the zigzag appear as you're weaving. And so that'll be, that'll be up onto the weaver to define that. Above this portion right here, right here, these are, this flowing element is like water. Yeah, water, and that's, uh, that's that one. This is the same thing at the very bottom. It's the same design, except just bigger. And then at the very top here, there's triangles, these triangles you see, and it's on this one as well. There's, some tri there's triangles on this one. That's a third element. That's, the, that's that water design. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, what I don't have an example of are squares. Squares are uh, another design element. Oh, thank you. Um, Diamonds are made, no, it's a, yeah, di it's diamonds, but what diamonds are really two triangles okay. together, <coughs> right? Let me do that. Yeah. yeah, I got it. Yeah. <laughs> so. You were uh, telling me earlier before you started that you've traveled all over the world giving mm -hmm. demonstrations and talks. Mm -hmm. Can you describe where you've been you know, sharing this message? Mm. I'll get behind you. Yeah, sure. A couple of, I'll be okay if I stand this way? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a couple years ago, I went to London, uh, and my sister lives there. My sister with her Air Force husband lives there. So I had an opportunity to go to the Pitts River Museum and the British Museum. And they both have uh, Salish weavings in their collections. Mm -hmm. So I did research there, and I did a demonstration and presentation. In that situation, because the travel is way too far for me to bring looms, with me to teach a class, I, I don't offer to teach a class. <laughs> Unless I have a woodworker there who could make the looms, I suppose, but I didn't do that. But yeah, so that's an example. Um, let's see, where else? I guess that's probably the farthest place I've gone. I've gone up into Canada in various times over the years and done things up there. Um, I have a lot of students up and down, up and down the I-5 corridor and uh, over 20 years of, of teaching will do that. And um, I suppose I could wrap up or so to share that, you know, 
originally, back in the day, probably like 40, 50 years ago, there really was only two weavers in the state of Washington. There were people up in Canada weaving, but it wasn't really crossing the border so much. So the two people weaving were uh, my master teacher, Bruce Miller, and then up farther north in Lummi territory, or Bellingham area, there was Bill James from Lummi and his late mother, who's passed away now. And so while that was two, this really one, because it's a mother and son team. And that was really it. Those two were teaching. And yet, to apprentice, it's a long apprenticeship. It, as you can imagine, it's a long apprenticeship. And so each one, while they would take on apprentices, you have to keep learning to learn it all. And life happens. You know, if you have to go to work to make the money to pay the gas to go sit at the foot of the master, well, I have to work this weekend. I can't go learn how to weave. You know, so they, things would get started, but it would kind of fall to the wayside. But I do believe that what happened was I was in the right place at the right time with a good heart. And all sorts of things lined up so that I could be his apprentice for that long. And then when he said to me, it's time to go teach, and I was absolutely um, freaked out, <laughs> uh, you didn't say no to that. If your master teacher says, go teach, it's time to teach. And you get shoved out of the nest and you go do that. And so that's how that whole thing started. And many people have learned. And now I have what I call great, great, great grandchildren who as far up into Canada in the Coast Salish Territory will say, you know, I learned from that, 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 and they learned from you. So in that way, I have done, and I continue to do my job, which is to be the strongest link that I possibly can be in this long chain of Coast Salish weavers. I didn't create the weave style. It's not going to die with me but I'm going to turn myself over to something that will live past my lifetime and their lifetime and their lifetime and their lifetime. So how many weavers are there now? I mean, oh. how many teachers are there now? You said there were two before. At this point, I, I don't, lots, lots of people take on teaching. I will say that. Okay. But I personally have taught over 2,000 students. Wow. And so those students have taken on students. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Th not everybody becomes a teacher. Right. Yeah, definitely not everybody can teach her. Um, yeah, thank you. I don't have any flyers, but the artist gallery that's east, no, north, north of, of the mall, mall across the, where? Uh, uh, TJ Maxx's parking lot. Yes, TJ Maxx's parking lot, Bed Bath & Beyond. Yeah, yeah it's sandwiched between the massage place and um, Italia, there's the artist gallery. And it's various, it's not just weaving, it's painters, sculptors, woodworkers, glass. Uh, tiny bit of glass. I thought um, glass there. Oh, okay. A jewelry. Um, it's a lovely. Thank you for attending.